It is my tremendous honor to welcome you, our distinguished audience, and to collaborate with our expert panelists from around the world to chair this most intriguing and uh, exciting virtual roundtable discussion, Sovereign Wealth Funds, the Race for Returns and Economic Stability, on behalf of the prestigious Harassus Global Meeting 2021. The purpose of this virtual roundtable is due to there being a substantial interest in the activities and future direction sovereign wealth funds will take, particularly in a post-COVID world. One statistic from Prequin tracks 66 sovereign wealth funds with disclosed assets under management of 8.59 trillion, equal to 9.7% of total worldwide assets under management of 88.7 trillion. Furthermore, only 19% of sovereign wealth funds had formal ESG policies, according to Prequin, and they went on to say that funds that did were generally the larger ones. Sovereign wealth funds are true wealth holders, meaning cash, ass cash funds and assets belong to them and trusted custodians of their sovereign nation, their state, etc. And they are not a commercially driven enterprise operating as a service provider, investment advisor, asset manager, etc. that generally seek fees or similar remunerations. And for this reason, their focus and direction is of keen interest the world over. Much of the intrigue regarding sovereign wealth funds pertains to, well, firstly, there are the differing objectives uh, that members of our audience wish to clarify. Many are known to take a longer term view as investors when looking at investments and sometimes into the decades, which is highly attractive to selected parties seeking debt and capital. As a result, selected sovereign funds do have an appetite for illiquid assets that other asset owners may not. Some have been taking a more domestic focus during COVID, which has been quite interesting. And uh, there is interest in, interest in what that actually means going forward. Uh, their role pertaining to economic stability and market movements uh, is also a hot topic. But really, most of all, it just is that sovereign wealth funds are perceived as amongst the most uh, private and confidential of all institutional uh, investors and true wealth holders. So for this reason, uh, we have personally assembled a panel of highly knowledgeable insiders possessing very diverse and a dynamic understanding of specific sovereign wealth fund segments. So you, the audience, have obtained a balanced and global perspective into this commonly misunderstood investor segment. So without further ado, and to answer some of your burning questions you may have, it's my pleasure to share with you the official description of this virtual roundtable panel discussion, Sovereign Wealth Funds, the Race for Returns and Economic Stability. Many sovereign wealth funds have embraced environmental, social and governance, ESG, for international diversification, but what are their views on investment strategy and asset classes of choice in a post-code world? What are the key trends they consider pivotal in the coming three to five years? And how does this affect their criteria of traditional and alternative investments? Now I'll uh, kindly introduce the panel. Firstly, my guest to my right is Mr. George Kanan, who is the CEO of the Arab Bankers Association based out of the United Kingdom. Welcome, George. Thank you. Thank you. And good morning to you all. Thank you, George. And uh, Michael Madwell, who is president of the Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute based out of the United States. Welcome, Michael. And Ole Bjorn Roste, who is associate professor of political science based out of Norway and has a soon to be released uh, book on the, on the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, welcome, Ole. Thank you very much, Peter, and good morning to you all. Thank you, Ole. And uh, as chair, I'm uh, Peter J.R. Awen, who is director of ATOS Holdings and ATOS Limited, United Kingdom and internationally. So look, uh, let's kick this off, gentlemen. Um, I think what's probably most Im important to, 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 to give a, a context to, to, to what we're going to discuss shortly is a little bit about on your background, areas of focus, and what led you to being uh, interested or affiliated with sovereign wealth funds. Why don't we start with you, Ole? Yeah. Uh 
I was introduced uh, to sovereign wealth funds by, by default, more or less, because I worked at Norges Bank at, uh, back in the 1990s, early 1990s. Uh, and I remember one morning we heard that uh, two billion kroner had been deposited. The, the framework was already in place formally from 1990, I think, but nothing had really happened and didn't think much of it at the time. But then they started to move quite rapidly. And since that, uh, it has been a growing interest of me too. But I, I should specify that it is particularly the Norwegian fund that I have had a keen interest in. And also, I have to perhaps make it very clear that I, I'm sharing my views here as an individual. I'm not representing anyone, not my former employers or anyone else. Thank you. Of course, Ole. And uh, Michael, um, I'd love to hear about uh, what was sort of the, the catalyst that got you in, interested in this subject and the formation of um, Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute. Sure. Uh, before founding SWFI, was at CalPERS short for a brief stint and then worked for a company called Thompson Financial. But uh, founded Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute, originally just trying to focus on sovereign wealth funds and their operations started the organization in the late 2007, 2008. Um, and this is when they started coming on the scene, bailing out Wall Street. Uh, before that, there was a whole protectionist scare. And now, uh, fast forward today, we've evolved the organization into a more of a, a data subscription company. So we provide information on sovereign funds, pension plans, family offices to a wide range of investors and banks and asset managers. So that's sort of where we lie on. And we also do some consulting work as well. But I, it, it, there's, it's, it's a very long story, but uh, I'll, I'll just keep it short for now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And George, of course, again. Well, at the moment, I run something called the Arab Bankers Association in London, created about 55 years ago in London. And uh, behind its, create, at, at its in its earliest form, it enjoyed a great deal, a great deal of support from the uh, uh, the sole existing fund at the time, what, they, what, what was technically a, a wealth fund, the Kuwait Investment Office, but also a, a great deal of support from what was the the piggy bank of Saudi Arabia, was the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority, um, and uh, since then we have uh, enjoyed the membership and support from the various wealth funds in the in the Arab world. Uh, I personally uh, ran uh, through uh, an operation in London, a segment of uh, Sama's uh, portfolio for five years or so, uh, and uh, have had the close relations with uh, uh, with uh, Arab funds, uh, submitting on occasion uh, papers to them on how they should uh, think uh, about uh, investing. Um, mm -hmm. I think we that uh, this is a, a, a truly important subject. And uh, by the way, I look very much forward to to the book by Ole uh, on the on the Norwegian fund. Uh, Norway, in a very strange way, is, is should be an example for what of the most Arab countries should be doing. Uh, I think that should be well received. Now, yeah, thank you very much for that perspective, George. Um, and, and, and getting into sort of some of the detail of our discussion here, I mean, what are the key views of sovereign wealth funds on investment strategy and asset classes of choice in a post-COVID world? Do you feel these are the best path or do you have alternative suggestions? Ole, let's start with you. Yeah, I think first, first of all, you're, you're talking post-COVID. I think that is a little vague. It may be a U-shaped recovery, what we call it in economics, or, you know, take time. But evidently, it, it will, will become better. It already is getting better. And I think what we will see is that inflation will pick up. We already see strong signs of that. So I think that the real assets will be perhaps even more uh, preferred than previously also now i think we are you know with regard to norway at least you know there is a 70 percent equity share in the in the, in the strategic benchmark index and that takes care of the returns more or less in you know together with the alternative Asset. So over time, perhaps fixed income will also provide something, but a chunk of fixed income must be must be held for liquidity purposes. In, in any event, I think that this COVID 
the story that you have hopefully soon behind us now shows it, it's a tremendous example of how unknown the future really is that we think we know because we have seen the past and days tend to be a bit like the days we have seen before. We cannot take that for granted and therefore there is a big liquidity need even for a very long term investor, I think. Indeed. And what do you think, what, have you got any studies you've looked at on what they're doing in, in the illiquid asset uh, category as well? What are your views on your illiquid assets? My view is that it is very, you know, it was a big success after the uh, grand financial crisis or what you call it, you know, the, the big recession that mm-hmm. they were positioned, you know, to, to uh, or, you know, sold insurance in a way to the market uh, for liquidity purposes. And uh, it was underwater for a long time, but then recovered nicely. And because of the long time horizon, that, that is something that you can do. But of course, it is... <laughs> You may un, you may overestimate, I think, the, the 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 extent to which a fund is long term, because at the end of the day, it is politicians who decide this. You know, they, they can make decisions to to change that approach uh, gradually or even even more abruptly. We, we can't know that. So so I think there there are limits to what you can do, but it's a nice way to enhance returns if you have a very big fund for sure. Mm-hmm. Indeed, indeed. And Michael, again, same question. Um, your view on sovereign wealth funds on investment strategy and asset, asset classes of choice now that we're in a, a post-COVID world, or should we say a, a, a COVID world, hopefully coming into a more of a recovery. And uh, do you think these are the best path or do you have alternative suggestions? Sure. Um, so through our own research, we saw that sovereign wealth funds bought the dip and a lot of them made a lot of money in the public investment fund of Saudi Arabia. they bought a bunch of stocks. Um, a lot of other wealth did the same thing. Watched those stocks go back up, sold them, uh, borrowed money from the central bank earlier. So we think that sovereign wealth funds, like uh, the other gentleman on this call says that they can be providers of liquidity when there's distress in the markets. So basically uh, we think wealth funds will continue to act like banks, uh, get more into private credit, lend money where other Firms don't want to lend money uh, and compete against the private credit firms first as, you know, doing separate accounts, but then going down the pipeline to launching joint venture vehicles. And they did this before, you know, for 20, 30 years. Um, Also, um, when it comes to real assets and inflation, yes, inflation is already here. Uh, Transitory is kind of the word that there are all the central bankers are saying. Uh, we think it's it's actually worse than what the numbers are, and I think the investors know that. And so, competing for real assets is going to be very challenging. There's so many real asset funds out there; they will be competing with the Canadian pension plans, the sovereign wealth funds, and there will be bidding wars. And in addition, COVID did bring some risk. Uh, if you look at some of the sovereign wealth fund and pension plan holdings in European airports, they've done horrible. Um, that's not being reported right now, but uh, they're losing money. In fact, I believe in one of the countries, I believe Hungary or uh, one of those countries, they want to take the airports back over again. And GIC mm-hmm. and some Canadian pension plans actually own that property. So the battle for infrastructure has been tooted widely, but uh, there are a lot of cracks in the armor. Mm-hmm. Indeed, indeed. And George, again, uh, same question. I mean, what do you, you, you think are some key views of, of sovereign wealth funds on strategy and asset classes of choice now that we're in a post-COVID world? And do you feel this is the best path or do you have alternative suggestions on what they should do? Well, I think uh, COVID-19 created a great deal of uncertainty. And I think uh, generalizing over asset classes is, is, is dangerous. I think uh, uh, you're right on the inflation scale. And uh, in, in fact, uh, statistica, I think, which uh, uh, produces uh, numbers on the U.S. economy <clears throat> um, as if they, w- they haven't changed the rules in 1993, I think, tells you inflation right now in the U.S. is running at about 12 percent. Now, that is a big number, and that uh, calls for um, a very different way of thinking about investing. Now, that doesn't mean you rush into fixed assets because some of them, as you said, uh, in, in the infrastructure area have not done well at all. Uh, COVID also, of course, highlights the need for technology and for uh, to improve our technologies. And people are making money out of uh, new ideas since the since the, the pandemic began. We uh, 
we uh, have um, uh, we we have to think of that also as potentially. I mean, the the stuff is very highly priced as always, um, but there has to be opportunities to, to be looked at in technology. Uh, but, my, but the point really is, uh, in addition to uncertainty, I think. I hark back to days when um, it was a simple matter of uh, returns and metrics uh, managing these funds. Uh, now we have to think not only about the uncertainty of COVID, we have to think about the uncertainty of climate change, the uncertainty of food security, and the uncertainty in the in the, po- in the word politi- geopolitical environment, where there is an evident a huge shift in global <coughs> economic and political power. So lots to think about, really, when you're looking at uh, wealth funds and thinking long term. Indeed. Now, there's a very, very good points, gentlemen. Um, And that leads really into our our next question. And is what are the key trends sovereign wealth funds already consider or should consider pivotal in the coming three to five years? And how does this affect their selection criteria in traditional as opposed to alternative investments? Uh, Ole, I'd, I'd like to put that one to you. Yeah, well, we already touched a bit on this already, but I think one other thing that I want to point out is that for for an investor like the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, it is it is highly important to have a transparent and easy to understand structure, and that in my view could impose some restrictions on all the nice things you can do in finance because you could have a fund that could be uh, you know much bigger in terms of headcount uh, than today and do a lot of advanced things uh, in, in Norway. But but if you do that, then uh, it will be much more difficult to to have a good handle on what this is all about, for particularly for senior uh, politicians who are, after all, the responsible. For, I mean, the, the risk is... Uh, is structured so that it is the strategic benchmark that mm-hmm. you know determines the returns, and and then the manager can do a lot of things to enhance returns on different corners and edges, and not everyone gets all these details, and that that is okay to a certain extent. But I think there is also a need for oversight uh, in such a, an operation from a public policy uh, point of view. I think, and also I think it's important, as George mentioned there. The, the surrounding situation, for instance, of geopolitics, and you, know, you can have e- elegant economic modeling, but it is usually, you know, a framework of the United States in a peaceful time where you have markets that uh, lead to specific outcomes, and you may have intelligent uh, ways of approaching how, how this could become in the future. But but there are some risks here that are outside of that framework and that are very important and that have also changed in the recent years quite uh, quite uh, much, I think. Mm-hmm. Indeed. And uh, Michael, again, your views as well on some key trends the sovereign wealth funds consider or should consider pivotal in three to five years and how does this affect their selection of uh, traditional as opposed to alternatives? I think um, we need to look at sovereign wealth funds in a number of buckets. There's different types. So if we if we exclude the smaller sovereign wealth funds that are more strategic development sovereign wealth funds where they focus on job creation within their own country and they're trying to help out their own markets, take them aside. We're looking at the big sovereign wealth funds here, the the savings funds. Um, I think they're going to be looking at what mentioned earlier was technology and productivity, and that's where we've seen the most gains and return on investment is investing in tech stocks, startups. You don't need to put a lot of money down with a, with a lot of these companies, and also investing with um, you know other private equity funds, taking tech companies private. We'll see more of that coming through as the markets keep maturing and companies can be more efficient being private. Uh, I would say uh, on the more of the investment strategy side of things, we're seeing more AI, machine learning. I hate using these buzzwords, but uh, there's there's a second crack at that. A lot of these sovereign wealth funds use these hedge funds like Citadel, Two Sigma, you know, allocating money to them. They're thinking, well, why can't we do this ourselves? So mm-hmm. they, a lot of wealth funds are constrained by U.S. public pension fund salaries, so they can go out and hire uh, people who work at hedge funds, Wall Street, to build these processes in house and see how they can reshape traditional asset allocation. I mean, we're still operating on asset allocation Wall Street from from the 1950s. I mean, it's CAPM. It's crazy. Uh, the world's different now. Uh, 
modern monetary theory is here. What are we doing? Right. So we have to look at other ways of approaching asset allocation and and they're doing that at Audia. They brought in some professor looking at hierarchical risk parity strategies instead of basic uh, traditional asset classes, looking at clustering of, you know, different factors. And so I think that's going to be the future of investing in the, you know, three to five year span. Also ways to, um, again, be that provider of liquidity where other people don't want to play around. Well funds have that. The larger well funds have a longer time horizon. They're looking to lock in that cash without having to reinvest it every one to two years. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. And again, George, same question. I would add to that. Uh, I would add to that the dichotomy that faces uh, <clears throat> the sovereign wealth fund for now in, in, in the Arab world, uh, where uh, most of the country's earnings are coming from, still coming from uh, fossil fuels, and uh, where uh, the call for investing is into uh, uh, technologies that would limit or redu- reduce significantly their reliance on, uh, on those fossil fuels. So it's like using your own money to cut your own uh, throat. And uh, that is one, uh, one difficult uh, dilemma uh, to try to manage. Uh, I think uh, 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 the really, more, really important uh, trend which you have spoken about is, that, is the need for greater transparency, which means the need for far greater uh, care about uh, ESG type issues. Mm-hmm. And of course, worry about Political interference, which which is which is which will tend to reduce uh, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 way that, uh, to uh, reduce to restrict the way you think about those things about those investments scientifically. So you have you're driven now by political considerations as compared to other more rational, more economic considerations. Mm-hmm. No, th- thank you, George. Thank you. And you, you mentioned ESG there. And uh, to frame uh, my next question, I'll probably uh, just uh, elaborate a little more. Uh, where I think we are in the world of ESG is potentially where uh, other alternative investment categories, such as uh, private equity, uh, venture capital, uh, and others may have been about 20 plus years ago. But we're in a, in a bit of an interesting turning point now, as you'll notice, COVID being uh, one f- factor. You can look with uh, the Biden administration. They've got a huge... Um, element of um, a sustainability behind them as well. Uh, gender equality is becoming a major issue. Uh, one of the large uh, investment banks of the world said that they w- wouldn't look at investments unless one out of every six board members were female. So, and where I see this potentially going is that we, if we look back, if, if we go ahead 15 years and look back, this may have been that pivotal point where institutions start to embrace ESG. Now I could elaborate, uh, there, there's been many, many challenges uh, around that and, and the proper structuring of making it institutional worthy. Uh, but I certainly know from my, my um, direct involvement as a family office and collaborating with other family offices, ESG is a, is a mainstay of their activities. And they've been initial investors. They may, may put that one to five to 10 to 20, maybe even up to 100 million in. But it does need, of course, the hundreds of millions or even the billions to, to roll out uh, some of the larger ESG initiatives. Uh, but we're seeing, of course, creation of, of, of you know, new financial instruments, bonds, uh, funds, and even exchanges now around the theme of ESG. So that's to frame uh, things a little bit. But at least it's my, my next question, which has two parts. And firstly is, what are your views on the present uh, and future role sovereign wealth con- funds can play regarding ESG and social impact investments? And secondly, is do sovereign wealth funds view ESG in, and the finance and investment industry as in, in a positive light? an important part of their portfolios? Or have they been, like several others, um, resistant uh, because of all the product pushing, the promoters, and the greenwashing from uh, asset managers and the likes? Um, Oli, I'll leave that start with you. Yeah, I I think that uh, at least for for, uh, the case of Norway, I think it it is good to illustrate uh, the importance of this field. It's it's a highly important field, but at the same time, Norway can't save the world. So you have to say this is very important. You have to show that we mean that, and there have been, you know, ethical guidelines in place since uh, uh, 2004, uh, at least, and uh, just revised them now uh, uh, this year. So, so it's an, an active field, and there are several criteria for restricting the investment universe. 
based on all the bad things that you can think of that goes on in, in the world. And that, I think, has been highly successful uh, by and large. But also it brings it, it can get us into some trouble because not everyone likes to be told publicly that uh, the, this big fund can't invest in your activities because of you know the ethical viewpoints that uh, people have in Oslo or in Norway. So, so that's, uh, that's uh, it's also seen as official policy to a large extent, I think, and, and that's also not, uh, it's not as intended, but it's very difficult to avoid that, I think, in, in that situation. But still, it's, it, it's highly important, and the, the Norwegian Fund has been uh, been very much aware of and interested and active in this field, I think, all along the way. And now also, of course, you can you can uh, use a lot of resources on this, if, depending on how you how you structure the activities. And I'm not an expert on how, how this is working today, but I know for sure that it can you know it can distract or it takes attention away from from the main purpose perhaps but you can have separate departments that do these things but you need, you need to have that in the organization and that is also an, an issue i think or at least a potential issue that you have to balance the amount of things you're doing uh, at least actively but uh, with regard to avoiding the worst cases i think it's it's very easy sure but sometimes it it may bring political uh, unrest or uh, you know trouble or particularly with great powers and big companies. I think. Uh, in, indeed, and that that's the balancing act that they, they they certainly have to sort of manage uh, effectively. And again, uh, Michael, same question. Um, how, what is their view on ESG? Do they see it in a positive light, or, or are, they, are they resistant? And what role do you think they can actually play in ESG going forward and social impact? I think uh, Los R. Wolf and see ESG in a positive light. ESG is a very broad term, three different areas, environment, social, governance. I think the governance part's the easiest one. It's not as uh, controversial, right? Having good corporate board, separating the chairman and CEO, having diversity on the board, those are not such controversial topics. And so I think that's something that a lot of – and there's been studies shown that um, having good corporate governance typically leads to better performing companies. Um, not always the case, but – Typically. And then we have the social, which can get kind of controversial depending on the norms and values of that society and what they feel is acceptable or not. So some sovereign wolf ones can invest in gambling or drinking, right? Uh, and then we also have, or cannabis, and then we also have uh, the environmental part of it, right? How can we green the financial system, which has been sort of the, the, the topics that central banks are now talking about, even though <laughs> they might want to focus on QE, but the greening of the financial system, like the advent of green bonds. And so large investors, sovereign wealth funds, and large pension plans are buying these green bonds, creating that uh, benchmark. And so we will see more of that happening. But yes, I think overall, there is a full embrace of ESG, just a matter of um, which parts will, will make commercial sense. Um, and then uh, also, um, you know, can it, where can they measure progress in it, right? Uh, uh, and, and, you know, avoiding the greenwashing. I mean, that's that, that's something that um, mm. is happening right now. We're seeing a lot of companies doing that. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And George, same question. Their views on ESG, do they see it in a positive or a negative light? And what's the future role you feel they can play going forward? I'd like to echo what Michael said. <clears throat> Just um, add to it <clears throat> a, a greater degree of intensity. Uh, in the, in the area. If you start with the easy part, which is governance, you're absolutely right. For uh, the Arab investment uh, wealth funds, the governance issue uh, is not easy, but it's also very badly needed. The area does suffer from uh, bad governance, and if those funds are investing locally or regionally, uh, they could improve the situation dramatically by insisting on good governance. So it's badly needed, and it's easy to do. The second one, social. I think you might as well forget that stuff. Uh, you know, among uh, the Muslims are not going to accept a lot of what's being now touted in the in the West as being essential. Uh, so, uh, so you can you can forget that that's uh, that social stuff is uh, is bound by country is bound by country by religion by tradition, and those are very strong in the area and. Uh, 
and uh, the, the wealth funds are not going to deal deal with them or require them or insist upon them or, or any such thing. Just keep as far away from them as possible. Uh, the real problem, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is with the EU, the environmental stuff, with the green stuff. And um, uh, how should we think about investing uh, in, uh, in view of what is necessary to do, which is managing emissions? Um, if we've, got to, we've got to face this fact. Whether they invest in it, whether those funds invest in it or not, it's going to happen. So you, may, you, you could say that they might as well invest in things that perhaps um, um, could result in more use of oil, but not in more emissions. I don't know how that would be, but let's say that could be possible. Um, they would invest in, um, uh, I mean, uh, in invest in alternative energy. What, how, how does that work? You know, you get uh, you, you've got plenty of sun in those parts of the world, in our part of the world. You want to use it to uh, stop producing oil? <laughs> I don't know how that works. Uh, it doesn't. So uh, there's a lot to worry about there. And a lot, a lot of deep thinking needs to be done. And a lot of difficult decisions need to be taken. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is the issue, which is not captured neither in ES or G, which is food security. That part of the world mm -hmm. has no water. That part of the world has no food. It relies on its food imports from all over the world. The wealth funds have got to worry about that for the benefit of their own people. They've got to worry about it. They've got to start thinking about it. They've got to start. I, I wrote uh, Prince Salman, who's now King Salman, a, a paper a few years ago telling him that food security does not mean that you pump water from aquifers to produce tomatoes at about $15 a, 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 a tomato. Uh, it, it means that you have to learn how to become part of the food production, distribution, trade, etc. cycle around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to own uh, interesting assets, food producing assets uh, around the world, the complementary, geopolitically uh, insensitive uh, uh, manner. Um, that's, uh, you can say, ESG and F. <laughs> Indeed. Right. And we, we brought up governance. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll keep the next sort of uh, few questions sort of answers sort of short and sharp. But the Santiago principles were aimed to promote transparency good governance, uh, accountability, and prudent investment practices, whilst encouraging open dialogue um, and a deeper understanding of sovereign wealth fund activities. But what are your thoughts on this? And I'll direct this one towards you, Michael, because I know you look quite deeply at this. Do you feel that the Santiago principles were effective, or are there other factors which needed consideration to alter or improve the objectives of uh, Santiago principles? Uh, well, overall, they are, they're a good thing. I think... Uh I'm echoing everyone's comments here that transparency is always a good thing in most cases, except for front running, but it's good for organizations to have levels of transparency and the Santiago principles accomplish some of that. Uh, we actually came up with our own index a while back called the Lindenberg Mal Transparency Index. It's a 10 point index, very simple to use, but all these indices are all uh, voluntary. So you don't really have to, even if you're part of the club, you don't have to comply with all of them. And so there is a bit of controversy behind that. There's actually a really big story, long story, on how those principles were actually formed. Don't have time to go over it right now. But overall, having these sort of codes are, are always, I think, a plus, especially if they help promote uh, you know, governance transparency, right? And sunlight's the greatest disinfectant. So understanding the chain of command, who has the power to make the investment decisions, Right now, you can see the wealth funds that failed in that. Just read the news. I mean, they, I won't name names, but, you know, you will definitely know. One, they actually made a movie out of. Um, so uh, having clear governance standards, making sure, you know, um, is, it, is it too tied to the executive branch or is it more in, independent on its own? Do you have um, – so, so all these factors are really important, but – Yes, I think overall the San Diego principles are a plus. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, was Norway a signatory of it? I think Norway opted out. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know that for sure. But so if you think that's that's probably right, but I think Norway has at least participated in the in the meetings. So I don't know. It's it's yeah. I'll check that later. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to check that later. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And uh, I'll just uh, also we'll jump quickly to direct um, and co-investments. 
in comparison to investments in traditional asset classes such as equities, fixed income, managed funds, and investment grade or alternatives. Some are investing uh, domestically, as we, we know, to support, support local industry, um, but also as well, others are investing directly for international diversification. Perhaps, Ole, could you elaborate a bit more on, on uh, direct and co-investments uh, that you think uh, Norway is looking at? Mm. I don't think I have so much to say about that, really. Uh, could you be more specific, please? I'm uh, sorry, I didn't... Well, I'll give you an example. I, I know some of the sovereign funds, for example, have set up international branch offices so they can integrate and collaborate with uh, local industry a lot more in some cases. Or when I say they're investing directly or in a co-investment, they want to, for example, say buy a building more specifically with a... But they'll actually do it directly, not through a fund or a managed uh, investment structure. So where they're actually going into the market themselves and buying assets... Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting thing that I should know more about. I, I will uh, not try to <laughs> pretend to know things that I don't know about. Is it, That yeah. may be more eternal, although most of the operations are very transparent, so maybe it's uh, easy by, just by a few clicks to find this out. Uh, I'm so, sorry about that brief answer on this. But, no, um, no, that's fine. George, uh, direct and co-investments. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I always thought that the real issue for the, some of these funds uh, who uh, are in, in certain our case, are in underdeveloped economies, um, is for them to look for external direct investments that would somehow reflect back uh, on uh, on progress back home. On progress back home, mm-hmm. uh, I think some of these efforts have have been tried without success, um, and I think uh, some of them have been tried without success in two ways. In um, uh, you invest with other guy, he still doesn't come through, or um, you invest in a guy who really can't come through. So both ways, you made the wrong decision in the first case. Second case, you uh, you made the right decision, but uh, you didn't get the right response. Um, I think this remains the most critical uh, need uh, area where there, there has to be thought. I will give you billions invest in your shares and to expand your kind of grow your company. But I want some of that growth to be back in my country, in my economy. Well, this is, this is not superficial. This is very difficult to do. And, um, and I, but, but I urge managers of those funds to think along those lines. Of course, there has to be the local element too. And uh, a fund has an obligation in every sense of the word to invest locally to encourage local entrepreneurs, um, albeit that opens up the route, uh, the door, uh, the route opens up the door for corruption, I would say, for fraud. Internally, people think that this is a pool of funds that belongs to one. I might as well put my hands in, in, the, in the till. Anyway, in any case, uh, one, one problem with sovereign wealth funds is the combating of financial crime. Indeed, indeed. Well, look, uh, we'll keep this these next few short and sweet, like around thirty seconds each. But uh, just um, we'll fire these around so we can give our audience that last uh, sort of a bit of key information. Are there any trends, misconceptions, or key points you feel are missing from this conversation uh, that they should be aware of regarding sovereign funds, um, Michael? Thirty seconds. I just think I mean there's so many different ways to tackle this in a in a one hour span. Um, just to kind of go more into the co-investments and direct investments. I think it's a tremendous opportunity. I also want to echo the whole food security thing. That is a very serious issue, and uh, that will be a topic to, you know, happen in the next few years. Mm-hmm. Ole, same thing. Yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. I think I don't have anything specific to add at this point, I think. Okay, and George, is there uh, any uh, key point, misconception, or something you feel is missing from this conversation? Not missing, but I think one thing that we should look uh, forward to uh, for, unfortunately, is for probably increased political interference. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the idea of having something on the side managed by professionals for the good of the country is uh, not going to survive. And this is my favorite part of every conference. Um, in 30 seconds, and as a special gift and insight just for our audience here at Harassus, if you had to pick one or maximum two, two insights you feel are most important about your work on sovereign wealth funds generally um, or, 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 or just their perspectives, 
um, what you feel their focus or role should be going into the future. What is that um, one key insight you'd like to leave them with, uh, Michael? I would say focus a lot on the uh, technology side of things using, you know, investing in new tools on how to find investments. It's more of a tactical uh, element, but I think that's something that um, will help them jerk it alpha. Ole, any final insights you'd like to share? Yeah, I think uh, looking back to the to the two billion kroner in 1996, that was the start. I think that was 27 years after Norway f- found oil big time. So it's like uh, it's like as if a 20 year old postpones retirement savings till he's 47, you know, or she is 47. So in it's not quite like that because all the money was not wasted; it was used for infrastructure and certain things. But but. Uh, the compounding of capital is so powerful that uh, many people wish that you should have started earlier. Today, I mean, this funds one fifth of the state budget without any taxation, which is a very enviable position to be in. I can imagine some other countries have other statistics on that. That's extraordinary. And is there one uh, key insight you could leave yeah. our audience with? Other than good tactics, what, uh, as Michael said, what we really need is good strategy. And um, and uh, well thought, discussed with uh, broad segments of the community, political as well as uh, civil society. Uh, I think that's what's really needed. Thank you very much, George. Well, this concludes our uh, our discussion on sovereign wealth funds, the race for returns and economic stability, directly from the experts themselves, all of which possess very diverse and dynamic backgrounds. So if you've obtained a balanced and very much a global perspective. We could go on and on and on, and uh, I, I only wish we had uh, several hours to, to discuss this because there's so much depth we could we could go. And uh, I really do feel that uh, if sovereign wealth funds um, uh, you know, going forward, they can continue to play a very, very vital role in our financial ecosystem. What we've covered today is gain greater insight into some of the key views of sovereign wealth funds on strategy and asset classes of choice in the post-COVID world the key trends they already consider or should consider pivotal in the coming three to five years and how this affects the selection of um, traditional versus alternative investments, the views um, on present and future role of sovereign wealth funds, what they can play as far as ESG and social impact investment, the role they can play in uh, co-investments, direct investments, uh, technology, et cetera, et cetera, Um, Also as well, the key point, which was the Santiago principles, which was to focus on areas of of governance and transparency. We covered that as well. And of course, my favorite part, which which is, of course, that one takeaway insight shared by each expert panelist that they feel is most important about sovereign wealth funds, uh, their perspectives, focus and role in the institutional and financial ecosystem. We strongly encourage all of our distinguished audience to take uh, action with this tremendous knowledge and insights provided today and welcome interactivity and collaboration, which has made Harassus so successful over the years. Therefore, for further thoughts or questions, you're welcome to reach out to Harassus directly. Um, You can reach out to myself via email at inquiries, that's with an E, inquiries at ATOS Investments, that's A-E-T-O-S investments.com, via LinkedIn at Peter J.R. Aylwin, or our website, which is adosinvestments.com, or our expert and distinguished panelists by their social media and details provided with their bio. This concludes our Sovereign Wealth Funds, the Race for Returns and Economic Stability virtual roundtable discussion. I'd like to thank our expert panel. Thank you, uh, one and all gentlemen, um, for your very, very valuable in, uh, insights and contributions. The committed staff of Harassus, and particularly uh, Harassus Chairman Frank Jürgen Richter, who is the visionary behind this entire community for his dedication and commitment, which has made this engaging virtual roundtable possible. Ladies, gentlemen, and our distinguished guests, I wish you unparalleled success, prosperity, and safety, and a most exciting rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.